Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and I am planning out my garden for 2020. I'm here sitting uh, at my computer uh, online choosing the different uh, seeds, the different varieties I'm going to grow and figure out where, all they're, where they're all going to go. And uh, I thought I would take you with me through that process, how I decide what I'm going to grow, how I figure out where it's going to go, how I plan out, map out my garden, how I reflect on the previous season. Uh, you know, build on success, learn from failures, and so on and so forth. How I do that whole process, right? So, uh, hope you find it interesting. Come along. Let's uh, let's plant a garden. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Garden plan for 2020. I'm going to walk you through my process here. I'm going to walk you through how I choose the seeds I'm going to grow, how I decide where everything is going to go and how I make decisions from year to year on how to change things, uh, readjust the garden, adjust from mistakes I've made, learn from mistakes, and so on and so forth, because mistakes are a part of it. Even when you're a person like me with a huge garden that has lots of success, every year there's things that go wrong, and uh, you have to sort of step back and think about it and come up with a new plan for the following year. So what you're looking at here, I'm sharing my screen with you, is an Excel file where I take a picture of the garden and I use a text box. Um, if you have never used Excel before and you have uh, the Microsoft Office suite of products on your computer, it's, it's, you can do this in anything. You can use Microsoft Word, you can use PowerPoint, you can use Excel, you can use whatever you're used to. I'm, you know, I find Excel is really good for this because it's got different tabs and I'll walk you through why I think that's a good idea as well. Um, but I take a picture of my garden from above. I'm lucky because on the south side of my garden, I have a hill that I can walk up and get a sort of good overhead, overhead shot. I can't get the whole thing on one screen, so I take two pictures. This is the sort of right-hand picture side of the garden, the, I guess the south side, and this is the other side of the garden, right? You can see uh, over here where um, these trees are is this spot, right? So two pictures to get the whole garden in. I got about roughly a 2,500 square foot garden, give or take, right? So that's what I do. If you don't have a hill, you can maybe get up on your roof and take a picture or get a uh, really high, maybe seven foot step ladder, get a picture from there or use some sort of uh, flying picture device that you can, I don't know what those things are called, but uh, those devices that, uh, you know, drone camera, that sort of thing. That's another way you can go about it. Lots of different, or you can just draw a picture. And of course you don't have to use Excel or Word or PowerPoint or anything else. You can just take a picture and write on the pen, print it off and write on it with a pen. <laughs> That's a really good way to do it. Pretty low tech, totally effective. Um, so I've been doing this for a number of years. And uh, the great thing about Excel, and I'm not trying to plug Excel, <laughs> right? but it just came with, uh, you know, all that other stuff, um, is you can have different tabs. So you can have a record of what you've done in previous years, right? And what I do every single year is I have a garden uh, plan. This is my 2017 plan. Usually that's based on a picture of the garden from the following year. So the 2017 plan is overlaid over a picture that I would have taken of the 2016 garden. Here's my 2016 garden. And there's a 2017 plan, same picture, right? So I have a plan for a garden and then later on in the year after the garden's fully realized, I actually write down or paste in these text boxes of uh, what I actually did because the plan is never exactly what I did, right? <laughs> I got this idea from my job where, uh, you know, I work for the government and the government always has estimates for all the things it's planning to do for a given year. And then they have the actuals, right? What, what we think it's going to cost to do all that stuff and what it actually costs to do all that stuff. Um, any estimate is never perfect. So there's always things you can't foresee and so on and so forth. So there's always an estimate. And there's always an actual. So this is the same sort of thing where you've got a, a plan and then the actual realized garden for a given year. So to go back to the beginning, how I choose my seeds for a given year. I go to... Um, uh, my sponsor is Vessi Seeds, so, you know, if uh, you want to support my channel, buy your seeds from Vessi Seeds. If you're in Canada, the U.S., uh, they ship to the U.S. I'm not, I'm not sure if they, they ship to every state. Um, you can try, and if it doesn't work, then get it, get, get your seeds for where, wherever you can get them sort of thing, right? <laughs> but, um, 
Uh, if you want to use Vessi Seeds, there's a coupon code. There's, just, there's uh, details in the description box of this video and just about every video I've ever done uh, in recent years anyway um, for the details of that coupon code. The code is GAVS20 um, for the 2020 year. Basically, you can order any for anything from Vessi Seeds in 2020. And as long as there's a seed, a pack of seeds included in your order, you'll get that order with free shipping, which adds up when you're ordering things like uh, uh, apple trees and potatoes, you know, things that are relatively cost costly to ship. And the only thing that the, the free shipping deal doesn't work for is oversized items like rototillers and things like that, right? But as long as you're ordering seeds and, you know, plants, and it works for potatoes and it works for apple trees and, you know, uh, fruit, uh, you know, bear whips, roots for, works for all that sort of stuff, right? So, um, you know, try it out if you want to. That's great. That's the end of my Vessi's plug. Um, I will give a plug for just in, in general, the concept of buying seeds online. There's a lot of advantages for buying seeds online because, um, you know, you can, you can go and you can get interest in a particular kind of plant. Let's say I'm interested in growing spinach, for instance. So I click on spinach and, uh, you know, all the different varieties, uh, are there. And let's say I'm interested in growing, um, I don't know, respond or spinach. So I click on that and Vessi's uh, provides a little write-up, some details about growing that, 285 a pack for, you know, route for a small pack, right? Um, but let's say I wanna, of course, Vessi says it's the greatest thing ever, <laughs> right? I don't think there's any other spinach where they say, uh, oh, this tastes terrible, don't, don't buy it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so of course they're gonna say attractive, they're gonna say everything nice they can say about it, and they're gonna have some detailed things about in maturity dates and so on and so forth. Um, you can assume all that is accurate, um, but some of the other stuff is pitch. So if, if you've got, um, you know, uh, misgivings about a, a given variety, right, you can, you can copy that and you can, um, you can go to Google and you can Google that variety, right? And you can find different websites that have spoken to that variety. You may even find a YouTube video of someone that grew that actual thing or Pinterest or Facebook or someone's blog or so on and so on and so forth. And you can read what other people say that have grown that thing. Or even if you're lucky, if it's a particular variety, perhaps uh, uh, an agricultural extension has spoken to the properties of that variety and so on and so forth. Because, you know, Vessi's has lots of different varieties and they, um, some of the varieties are, you know, um, the reason I like to use them is they, they tend to look for varieties that are, um, fast growing, ideally suited to a short growing season. I have a short growing season here or they're disease resistant, resistant to various diseases. So if you have a particular disease or a particular, uh, um, you know, problem that's a uh, unique, a pathogen or whatever that's unique to where you are, perhaps you can find a variety that's resistant to that. And so you won't have that problem, right? Um, so it's really handy in that sense. But the main reason that I like Vessi seeds is because they choose varieties that are ideally suited to a short growing season. And that's what I have, right? I'm in zone 6A, which doesn't really tell you much because there's lots of people in a zone 6A, which has a really long, fantastic growing season. Uh, I used to live in Ontario, southern Ontario, with zone 5A. So it's even colder than where I am. But all that speaks to is how cold it can possibly get in the winter. It doesn't speak to the actual uh, dynamics of the growing season, right? The zone just speaks to how cold it gets and how survivable that environment is for given perennials that... Uh, you know, have to have to survive the winter. Um, where I live, we have uh, frost in late May, typically, we have frost in September, right? So it's only um, June, July, August that are frost free. And on top of that, uh, April and May, especially unique to where I am, this particular part of the province where I live, not the whole province where I live, uh, we have a lousy spring, it's foggy, it's overcast, it's cold, and it's rainy. So we don't get good quality sun for those months, right? You might live somewhere else where it's nice and sunny in the spring, so you can get a real head start, especially if you're using plastic domes or various kinds of microclimates and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, for as, Vessi's, um, for, for just about everything they sell, uh, like if I look at this tomato here, they'll tell you how, how quickly it matures. So I'll tend to choose things that uh, mature faster than other things because I haven't got a lot to work with here. So I'm going to talk about more of that as we go along here, but... Uh, anyway, all I do, you go to their website. All right, let me get rid of some of this noise here on my uh, page here. Um, I go to their website. If you hover over where it says vegetables, you'll see a list of all the different vegetables. 
and I just work my way from A to T. <laughs> I don't know why zucchini is under squash. It's a summer squash. Uh, it would be nice if there was a Z for zucchini. But anyway, I work my way from A to T and I click on everything that I want to grow. And then I make a list in Excel. And I put those things, I put the name down. You don't have to put, the, you don't have to do it this way. This is just the way I do it. Uh, I order it from them and they, you know, uh, full disclosure, they provide everything, all, all my seeds, they give everything, everything to me for free, right? Because they sponsor the channel, they sponsor the podcast, the cast, and they make this all possible. So there's, I don't have to pay to do this for you, right? <laughs> they're paying for it. So that's great. And, and they're very hands off. I mean, they're, they just say, do your thing. Um, you know, here's some money for your website and so on and so forth. And here's some free stuff. Um, so that's great. Right. And then they don't tell me what to do. They don't direct anything. They're just a great partner. And I'm so grateful that they do this with me. Uh, I make a list of everything I want to grow. And then, uh, what I do is I have this, uh, you know, map of my garden. I try to find a space for everything. If I can't find a space for everything, it comes off the list, right? That's what I do. So uh, you can see, I have, uh, I'm going to plant the uh, Ferrano Romano bean. I like that one. And, uh, I'll put a Y if I've actually found a spot for it. And I work my way down this whole list. And if I can't put a Y beside something, it comes off the list and I don't order it because I won't be able to plant it. If there's no place to put it, right, I'm not, I can't plant it. So I know there's lots of people that, you know, you, you, when you're looking at a thing like this, you know, you click on anything, beans, right? Hey, I want, I want to plant some beans. And you click on it and there's like 40 kinds of beans. <laughs> you can only grow a couple different kinds, right? Because you get a lot of seeds in the pack. And, uh, you only got so much space and so much time and so on and so forth. You can only eat so many beans. So you pick the few that you want to grow and you got to find a space for them, right? So the way you avoid order over ordering, ordering too much is to just make the list and then go to your map and try to find a place to put everything. So that's what I do. I go to their website, I look everything up and I, and I, and then I make the list and then I try to find a place to put it. And how I choose one I'm going to grow. Let's use uh, tomatoes as an example, right? So let's say, and I did, I just did this this morning, picking out my tomatoes. Um, I, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound pretty low tech and pretty infantile, but I scroll through the pictures and I click on the pictures that look good. <laughs> Vessi's top pick, big beef tomato. Oh God, it looks really good. So, um, uh, um, uh, let's, let's have a look at that one. And, uh, oh, Bobcat tomato. It looks really nice. Nice and round and red, you know, so on and so forth. Look at these ones. Cherry Falls tomato. That looks really good. All right, man, I'll try that. Right. And I just work my way through the whole list and click on every tomato that looks interesting to me that piques my interest. Maybe I've heard about it. Maybe one of my viewers has spoken to the variety. Um, and so on and so forth. Right. I mean, you can only... <laughs> Spend so mountain merit. That's Vessi's top pick. Okay, let's check that out, right? And so on and so forth. Primo red tomato. It looks interesting. I also like to have some um, plum tomatoes for sauces and stuff like that. So let's try this plum regal tomato, and um, so on and so forth, right? And then let's grab another plum. Roma VF tomato. I think I grew this last year. And then what I do is I go to the write up on each of these, and I look at the properties of that plant. And what I'm looking for, for my growing conditions is something that's determinant for a tomato. Anyway, there's two kinds of tomatoes and a lot of plants, uh, vining, you know, tomatoes are like this or vining plants have this property. Some are determinant and some are indeterminate. Indeterminant mean the plant just keeps growing until it gets too cold to grow. Determinant means it grows until it reaches a certain height, then it stops growing and just shifts all its energy into producing the fruit, flowering and producing fruit. And if you have a short growing season, you want an, a determinant plant because you, you've only got so much season. You want it to just stop growing and give you the goods as soon as possible so that you can achieve a yield before the frost comes, right? So I walk through all the different things I've looked at and I'm looking for a fast maturity date. I don't want it to say maturity 100 days. Maybe if you live in Atlanta or, you know, the Southern state, or maybe, uh, Windsor, Ontario, or some, you know, some place where there's a lot of sun and a lot of heat, hot summer, lots of sun, so on and so forth. That's fine. Maybe a given variety of certain flavor or other properties that you're interested in. Um, but I have to grow things that mature quickly. So I'm looking for a short maturity date and I'm looking for something that's determinant. So the big beef 
is indeterminate. So I actually think I grew it last year and it worked out okay. But a better thing would be, I, for me, tomatoes anyway, I like to have three kinds of tomatoes in my garden. I like to have some big fat tomatoes for tomato sandwiches and, and salads and stuff like that. I like to have some cherry tomatoes because they're nice and salads and my wife likes them. And I like to have uh, plum tomatoes for sauces and things like that. Um, anyway, this one's out. And I think I grew it last year. But anyway, this one's out because it's indeterminate. I want a determinate plant. They're also easier just to uh, to stake, you know, to trellis and so on and so forth. So it's shorter. Big beef is out. Bobcat. It says, uh, of course, it's going to say beautiful and delicious and so on and so forth. And it's a hybrid. So you can't say this. None of that matters to me so much. I mean, uh, hybrid versus... Um, uh, open pollinated or heirloom the advantage of open pollinated or heirloom is that you can save the seeds with a hybrid if you save the seeds uh, the, the odds of you getting the same plant the next year are slim to nil <laughs> it's possible but it's very unlikely um, but um, you know um, there's different reasons why you want to make those choices um, for me um, um, the advantage of a hybrid that has the qualities I want outweighs the cost um, but you know you have to make those decisions for yourself um, so the bobcat tomato is a determinant and 68 days maturing. That's, those are good qualities. So I like that. I'm not going to delete that. This, uh, cherry falls tomato. Look at the size of the thing. It's actually like the kind of tomato you want to grow in a, uh, pot. Um, but I see no reason you can't grow it in a garden anyway. And, uh, it looks like it's going to be easy to manage and easy to maintain. And I mean, look at the, at least the picture anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Look at the yield, right? So I like uh, a well-behaved tomato plant that sort of, it says, uh, I think somewhere here, doesn't need, does not need staking. That's nice. That's convenient. So you got this short, fat, stout plant that produces a lot of tomatoes. Sounds good to me. Um, sweet, juicy. Okay. So I'm sure they're good. Um, so I'm interested in this one. And it doesn't tell me, it doesn't tell you here how many days to maturity. But look at the size of it. It can't take long. I mean, it's a short, fat tomato. It's going to grow fast. I'm fully confident. It's actually going to order this. I'm going to try this one. It says new, so they didn't have it previously. I'm going to try it. Um, this one here, Mountain Merit, light blight resistance. That's nice, right? Because if you get light blight, if that comes around, you can just wipe it all your tomatoes. And it's a uh, beefsteak style tomato from the looks of things, right? Disease resistant, 69 days, Mountain Merit, Primo Red. Uh, determinant again, so that's a good one. Plum Regal, uh, I think it's indeterminate. And uh, the Roma, it doesn't say if it's determinant or indeterminate, but it, oh, it's determinant. Deter determinant growing habit, right? I think the Plum Regal is indeterminate. Does it say it somewhere here? With the Roma tomato, if it doesn't say one way or the other, it's probably indeterminate. They tend to be indeterminate plants, they just keep growing. So uh, I'm inclined to go with the Roma because it says it's determinant, so I know it's going to probably work within my growing season. Also, for those of you that don't know, I, I don't start my tomato transplants indoors. I start them outdoors in May under plastic domes in a microclimate, and I get good results, so I'm happy with that. I'm sure there's people that get their tomatoes earlier than me because they start them indoors, but I still get tomatoes. The whole point of growing tomatoes is to get tomatoes. I get tomatoes. Yes, they don't really come along till late August, but I still get them. And it's just so much easier for me to start them outdoors. And I don't want to get in a diatribe of why I direct seed things outdoors. It works for me. I don't really have a space for it indoors. That's the short version. I've got lots of videos on why I do this and why I don't do it the other way. And if you do it the other way, that's fine. I'm not telling you not to. Okay. So I made my decisions with tomatoes and then I put them on my list, right? So for 2020, I'm going to grow the Cherry Falls tomato, the Bobcat tomato, and the Roma VF tomato, all determinants, all fast growing, you know, and I'm rolling the dice. They actually do have, I don't want to get hung up on tomatoes here, um, but they actually do have a set of tomatoes. I think if you look here on, on the first, uh, first tab, blight resistant tomato seed collection, right? So they have blight resistant tomato seeds. So they're fairly expensive to buy the seeds. Um, uh, but, you know, if that's not prohibitive for you and you want to ensure that your tomatoes are not going to get hit by some late blight that just wipes out the whole thing, go with that. So that's how I make the decisions for what goes on my list. Then I go to the garden plan 
and figure out a place to put everything. So this picture here is a picture of my 2019 garden, right? 2019 gardening season and where everything went. I'm going from memory, right? I've got a picture of the whole garden and I've, I've put a text box on every bed of what I grew there. And then for 2020, of course, I don't want to grow things. I use uh, crop rotation. I move things around. I try to have no one thing, no one given category of plant um, in the same place any more often than every four years. I break the rule once in a while, but that's what I try to stick to because that's what the general uh, literature on the topic uh, suggests. I know people say, well, geez, perennials stay in the same place from year to year. So why can't everything work that way? Um, but um, perennials and annual, everything we're growing here um, in terms of the things on this list are perennials, <laughs> right? So, uh, or, sorry, everything on my list here uh, are annuals, right? These are all annuals. So annuals, uh, uh, it's arguable that they uh, extract a lot more from the soil. They have, you know, they grow really fast. They take a lot out of the soil and then they, they're done sort of thing. So there's an argument to be made for uh, not planting any one particular category of annual in the same place from year to year. And when I say category, I mean for th things like potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, right? Eggplant, they're all nightshades. They're all in the same category. So if I planted a tomato in this bed, I can't plant a tomato or a potato or a pepper or anything in that same bed the next year. You can do it and it'll probably work out fine. But there's always a risk of some soil-borne disease, some pathogen, or some pest setting up shop in that bed that is fine-tuned to destroying that plant. So, yeah, you can plant the same thing in the same place year after year if you want, but there's always a risk in doing that. You might get away with it, you might not, who knows, right? So, it's relatively easy to move things around from year to year and to set up a sort of rotation schedule. So uh, that's what I do. And of course, there's softwares you can buy that do all this for you. But um, I don't really see the point. And there's even free softwares for doing that. But I just, I like the flexibility of having a picture <laughs> and just popping things in. Also, I'm always, I'm, every year I change the configuration of my garden. My garden is never, my garden is perpetually evolving. I'm constantly changing the outlay. Uh, I'm still adding beds to it. And even for next year, I'm going to, change the configuration to get more out of the space uh, more on that as we go along so at the end of 2019 i write down where everything went and then i also at the very bottom of this uh, tab in excel write some notes so notes i put for myself was lose the cold frames i got three cold frames that i grow heat loving plants um, there's some issue about the design of these cold frames i probably could have designed them better I actually just don't like using cold frames for many reasons. Um, but the main thing is that you're kind of constrained in what you can grow in them. And they're only accessible from one side. Um, they're just, I don't find them as useful as the system I tend to use where I have a four by eight bed and I have plastic domes that fit that dimension that I put over the bed. So the, the system I'm evolving towards is instead of using cold frames, having a good number of beds in my garden that are built to the dimension of four by eight and having plastic domes, you know, uh, polyethylene plastic domes, <laughs> right? Uh, stretched over the bed and any given bed, any year modular, I can move it. I can put it where I want so that any bed I want can be a cold frame in any given year for as long as I want it to be in that year. And then it can just stop being a cold frame when it, you know, once it gets hot, you can't have the lids in your cold frame. Anyway, once you're into July, August, you got to take the, your cold frame basically can't be a cold frame anymore. Cause it's a way, way too hot frame <laughs> from that point of view. Um, so what I'm going to do for these, uh, cold frames is I'm going to change the configuration of the garden, right? The plan is to remove, I got a fence here. That's why the cold frames are backed up against the fence. I have a garden enclosure, right? A fenced area that keeps out the deer and the rabbits and the porcupines and the raccoons and all that. For the most part, it seems to do a pretty good job. I'm going to take this fence. I'm going to remove it from this area. I'm going to wrap it around the whole garden. And that's going to give me a lot more options. But it's also going to allow me to take these cold frames, take them apart, repurpose them. And instead of having three two by six beds... I think I'm going to get five or maybe even six, uh, four by six bed. I think there's about 
from from the edge of this bed to the edge of this bed it's about eight feet so i think i can go six feet i mean i'm going from memory here but give or take so i can get you know five or maybe even six four by six beds as opposed to three two by six beds so that's a lot more out of the same space and you know the problem with this fence is that there's all kinds of weeds that grow along here and so on and so forth i think i can just make better use of the space if i do this and I'm, I'm still not losing the convenience and the advantage of, of cold frames because I'll have plastic domes that can go over some of these beds so that any given bed in any given year can be a cold frame if I want it to be. So I have the flexibility, right? So I've got my um, list of things to plant. And then what I do is I try to find a place for everything to go, right? pepper pepper this is the 2019 garden but see i'm only going to have peppers uh where did i decide to put peppers up here in my garden this space sort of in the middle here is the hottest sunniest place so that makes sense to where i put peppers I, I have this bed here identified for eggplants and peppers last year where it says cukes this bed had eggplants in it so uh, i'm just going to move that over and generally speaking that's the system i'm trying to get to where uh, every year, whatever I grew in this bed, the next year it just goes down one. Uh, I don't stick to this perfectly. Uh, and I also keep changing the configuration of the garden, adding beds, moving beds. You know, I mean, that's the thing about having a garden. Uh, if you're evolving with your garden and learning as you go and that sort of thing, you're going to change your mind about where everything should go and where you're going to get the best results. You're learning from the space. You're learning from the garden. You're, you're plugged in. You're tuned in to what you're doing. And um, you're making notes. And as time goes by, you're changing your mind about where things should go. What's an ideal place to put things. If you had bad results somewhere in a given year, plant something like beans or peas. It'll grow anywhere. Plant potatoes sort of thing. If it's an area that you notice it was kind of shady, maybe you don't want to plant a heat loving thing there and so on and so forth. So I just try to find a place for everything to go. And then uh, if I found a place, I put a, see it says planned here. <laughs> Just put a Y there. It means I got a place for it. Once I've got a Y beside everything on this list, I order the seeds. If I can't find a place for it, I, I just I, I take it off the list. That's all I do. Um, so in terms of varieties, I mean, I got I, I you know um, first crop beet is a uh, beet that uh, grows really fast. So that's a good. One. People are always asking me like, well, man, how did you get such good results with your beets? I didn't get good results. Well, well did you look at how? quickly the beet grows, whether it's uh, amenable to your growing conditions, is it fast growing and so on and so forth. Um, this one, first crop, tends to, tends to work well. This uh, Taunus beet I grew a couple of years ago and had, it's a long, it looks like a giant fat carrot. It's a long cylindrical fat uh, beet. Really easy to peel, kind of ideal for pickling and stuff like that. So I didn't grow it last year, but I think I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm gonna go back to it because it worked really well, the Taunus beet. Uh, I grew some of this uh, broccolini last year, artwork broccolini. It's a, a broccolini that it works really well with the cut and come again approach to growing where you can, you know, cut them off and they grow back and you cut them off and they grow back and so on and so forth. So you plant them once and you get broccoli right up until like November, right? You start being able to harvest them maybe in June and you can harvest them right up until November. That's a great broccoli, broccoli all season, right? Um, these two carrots, uh, I believe, are the Imperator variety. There's different kinds of carrots you can order, but I like the long, tapered ones that go down deep. Um, the short, fat ones, they're not as good at finding their water as the long, narrow ones, right? The long, narrow ones go down deep into the ground, and so it just minimizes how much uh, time you have to spend watering your garden. Uh, for those that watch my channel a lot, you know that from June, July, or sorry, July, August, September, I, I don't uh, water the garden at all but I tend to stick with varieties that, that don't mind that, right? So a long, narrow, deep tapered pota tomato, or sorry, carrot, um, is gonna be better at finding water than a short, fat one sort of thing, right? Those short, fat ones might be ideal if you're uh, uh, in the agricultural business and you, you know, maybe they're attractive to people that are buying them, maybe they're ideal for s selling in bunches and stuff, maybe people like those. Um, but I'm not selling anything here. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing things that work really well for me. Uh, I'm going to try cauliflower this year. I haven't found a spot for that yet. Um, I'm going to go with collards. And uh, I, Every year I grow uh, kohlrabi, and no one in the house really likes it. I, I mainly grow it for the greens anyway. Um, so I thought, why not just grow collards instead? Because people like those more here anyway. 
Uh, I'm going to try corn this year. This is a fast growing new variety that they have. It's supposed to be very sweet. So I'm going to try that. Got some ideas. I, mean, it's car I have, have a really hard time growing corn where I am, but I think this one will work. A regal cucumber is the cucumber I use for pickling. Works really well. Um, Calypso is another variety. I might take that off the list. Um, these are just two different varieties of pickling cucumber. I just grow pickling cucumbers. You know, if I want to use them in a salad, you can just let them grow a little bigger and use them in a salad. They work out fine. I'm going to try the Black King eggplant because it grows fast. I'm going to, planning to try ground cherries. I like them. Maybe I can get my kids and wife to like them. They're, uh, if you've never tried ground cherries before, they kind of have a mango. They're a very tropical tasting thing. So uh, they're in that same, they're in the nightshade family, like a tomato. Um, the, the cherry is this little yellow cherry that grows in a little sort of paper package. When they fall to the ground, they're ready to pick. They're very tasty and very um, exotic tasting. Uh, I'm going to stick with the winter boar kale. Uh, I'm only ordering one kind of kale because I save my kale seeds from my um, Siberian kale every year, so I don't need any more than that. But I find this, this kale uh, is uh, just a really solid, relatively pest-proof uh, kale. Uh, and also it seems to hang on really well in the later months into the winter. I still have kale. It's, it's uh, January 10th as I record this right now. I still have kale out in my garden and, uh, I've got two plants left and I'm going to probably harvest them today. <laughs> I might make a video about that if I can find the time. Um, but this kale in particular, the winter boar kale, it can take the cold temperatures. So I grow winter boar kale and the Siberian kale, um, by December, the Siberian kale is really getting the, the, the tar kicked out of it. It doesn't look good. And, you know, you, you know, sometime in December, you have to harvest it. And it, it suffers in the cold. Um, this one seems to just, I mean, there's a point where, you know, if you're getting, if day and night it's below zero, you got to get your kale out of the garden. But if it's warming up and getting cold, warming up, this kale seems to hang on better than just about anything I've ever grown. Not only that, but it, changes its flavor so in the height of the summer the uh, siberian kale is a much better tasting kale to my mind anyway um, the winter boar kale i find i have to blanch it if i'm going to use it in a dish um, because uh, i don't like the taste of it in the height of the I mean, it's still good but i have blanch it and it seems to remove a, a bit of the uh, parts of the flavor i don't like but when you're getting into october november december this kale just tastes better and better and it, the, the character of it changes over time um, so the kale I've been harvesting the last few weeks has just been delicious, <laughs> really tender, really good, really sweet. If you like kale, um, planning to try leeks. Um, I've only ordered one type of lettuce here because, uh, I got some, uh, lettuce, uh, from, from other sources, but, uh, more on that, uh, later, I suppose. But, um, this is the one lettuce I tried last year that, uh, my wife seems, she's the big lettuce eater in the family. So I got to have a, a kind of lettuce that she likes. She liked this one. Uh, I'm going to try some different onion sets and uh, onion seeds, the North Star onion. These are the only two onion sets that Vessi sells. I've had good results with both of them. Uh, Albion parsnip. You've seen me pulling big, fat parsnips out of my garden. These are the ones I'm growing. Yes, they're a hybrid. People have asked me, you know, I grow, I grow Albion parsnip and I save my own seeds, which are the hollow crown variety. I like them both. I'm happy with them both. Um, but these do tend to be a bit bigger. <laughs> And they have a much better germination rate. Um, uh, this is a pepper that they sell, new ace pepper, that's really fast growing, short growing. Uh, every year I kind of have a different results with peppers. I think I had notes for the peppers about uh, uh, in my garden plan about uh, instead of growing them in the cold frame to uh, peppers under dome. I think they're going to do... I, I grew... Uh, a direct seeded eggplant last year under a plastic dome and they actually produced eggplant and worked out okay so i'm going to try that again this year and i've got some ideas to how to make that work even better um, and i'm also going to try um, a turnip um, right tokyo silky sweet turnip so vessi's has uh, a lot of different varieties of turnips and people have asked me if you go to that under r for turnip <laughs> rutabaga turnip uh, they've got these new varieties this year that I want to try. Instead of having these traditional ones that my, my kids aren't too crazy about, uh, I kind of have to drown them in butter and brown sugar for them to eat them. Uh, there's this thing called Tokyo Silky Sweet. Uh, the write-up for that really uh, piqued my interest, so I'm going to give that a shot. It's supposed to have really good greens and good turnip, so that's like two things, two in one sort of thing, so I'm going to try those. Um, 
And I'm trying some different squash this year and uh, the tomatoes, as you know. And I'm, I'm changing my, I think I grew giant Ford hook Swiss chard last year. This year I'm going to try uh, the ruby red uh, organic Swiss chard. It looks like it's got uh, good qualities. It's always good to try something new. Um, and I'm going to stick with the, exactly the same um, summer squash, zucchini. This says Cocazel and uh, Goldie Organic. Those are the two zucchini I grew last year. If you saw my garden last year, these worked out really. It worked out so well, I'm not going to mess with it. I'm going to stick with them. Uh, I'm pretty confident I can grow these two winter squash. So last year I grew uh, Warded Hubbard and um, Georgia Candy Roaster. I actually saved some seeds. I'm going to save some seeds. I don't know where I'm going to put all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try these ones. Uh, you know, there's just so many varieties out there. It's, it's, you know, I'm inclined, I'm kind of uh, adventurous type. So I'm inclined to try something new to see if maybe that tastes better. Maybe it stores better and so on and so forth. Keep trying different things. Anyway, so I do that, try to find a place for everything to go. And, uh, and that's how I order my seeds. Now, the great thing about having this in an Excel file is that you can go back and look where, you know, just watch your garden progress over time. Right? This is 2014. Look how little there was, right? That's the space. <laughs> 2015, a little bit bigger. I had these little circle gardens here, right? 2016, I, uh, that's the garden and then the actual uh, 2016 plan, the 2016 garden. I got away from those little gardens and decided this uh, longer oblong, you know, four by eight type thing was a better way to go. And then uh, 2017, uh, you know, again, different decisions, different configuration, right? 2018, different configuration, right? You can look, uh, 2017 garden, outside the garden enclosure, I only had one row, right? For 2018, outside the garden enclosure, uh, I had potatoes over there. 2019, uh, I had a plan to do even more on that side outside the enclosure, right? I had those beds, but I exp expanded. And by the end of 2019, right, I had these uh, these beds added. I think that's about as big as the garden's going to get. The only big difference for 2020 is I plan, plan to change the fence, remove it from here, wrap it all the way around. I've bought all the stuff I need to do it, but the ground is frozen right now. A couple days ago, we got like a foot of snow in a matter of hours. I had to shovel the driveway three times. And uh, winter is upon us, and it ain't going away anytime soon, as far as I can tell. So, uh, you know, lots to plan for next year. So, I mean, I'm working through deciding where everything, where all these things will go. And uh, when I've finished that, it, it's a it's an iterative process, and I take my time with it. There's no need to rush. Uh, I don't think this is going to run out of any of these things anytime soon. Um, and if they do, eh, no big deal. I'll just choose something else. <laughs> lots of things to choose from. Um, but, you know, I'm the type of person I tend to get up early in the morning, 5 a.m. So uh, I have an hour to myself. I can do whatever I want, right? I can work on my garden plan. I can edit a video for the YouTube channel. I can uh, work on that garden book that I keep promising I'm going to write. I can answer emails. I can watch a movie. I can play video games. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Uh, so I chip away at this thing. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to chip away at this thing and narrow it down to uh, exactly where everything is going to go. I'm sort of, I'd say, 85% done. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of overwhelming to do it all in one go. So I like to, to walk away from it and come back to it and think about it and, and mull it over and so on and so forth. Eventually I have a plan and uh, I'll try to find a place for all these things to go. And if I can't, then I take them off the list. So that's my process. Uh, I hope uh, the video is a bit of a rambling video. I'm sorry about that, but it's just the nature of this. Um, if you're if you're thinking about expanding your garden and you you know you get overwhelmed about how to do all this sort of stuff, it is very useful to have a garden plan because uh, when spring hits, you don't have to make so many decisions. You can just grab a, you know you can just look at your plan and say, okay, um, I got to plant. Uh, I tend to organize organize my seeds into uh, early, mid season, late season planting. So when it's early in the season, I just have a pack. I got a thing with all the early season stuff and I'll look at this here thing and figure out where I decided for th where things should go. And I just go out and plan. I don't have to think about it too much. I don't have to worry about all these, you know, the three dimensional chess of where all these things should go. I've sort of got it already mapped out. And of course, you're going to change your mind. You're going to make decisions on the ground 
as things evolve, that's going to happen. No big deal. But if you've got a plan, at least you've got a place to start. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. If you want to help support the channel, buy your seeds from Vest Seeds Seeds using the coupon code GAVS20. And until next time, get out there. Get at it. Have fun in your garden. Have fun planning next year's garden. Have fun buying your seeds. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.